Amen. Glad to have you again. Blessed be to you all who are here with us and those that are online. Let's go into prayer. Eternal and matchless, wondrous, awesome God that you are, we thank you for this evening, for the respite from the cold, for the beautiful sunshine that we enjoy, God, for the fresh air and the clean water. We know that man is not responsible for any of that. It's a blessing that you give us each day, and we don't take it for granted under any circumstances. Now, God, bless us with your presence again in this hour as we continue to study your word, as we continue to understand this wisdom and this idea of wisdom in our, in our minds and in our hearts. Bless those who are continuing to mourn on this day. Bless those who are in hospital rooms and convalescent wards and God in rehab trying to get back to normal. Look in on those who are not quite there yet, but God just didn't feel good for whatever reason today. And then God bless those of us who think that we're doing well because we're all sick enough to meet you at any moment. So we thank you for blessing us with another breath and another time and another place of life. It's in the name of Jesus that we do say this prayer. Amen. Amen. All right. We're in chapter 7 still, and we're looking at verse, I believe we left off with verse, verse, let me get it together, verse 15. Verse 15, where Coaleth is now talking about, well, let's just read it. Verse 15, I have seen everything in this meaningless life. Wow, he just starts right off. In, in the, uh, you know, he's optimistic here, including the death of good young people, the long life of wicked people. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions for anyone who fears God will avoid these both extremes. Well, let's look at this. The writer seems to think that he has seen the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper, which would be a direct refutation of Psalm 37, 25. Once I was old, I was young, now I'm old, yet I've never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging bread. Um, for those of you that are King James, you know, I was once old, now I was once young, now I'm old, but there I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the, his seed begging bread. That's that one. Have we seen the righteous forsaken under any circumstances? And we can be honest. We've seen some folks suffer. Not necessarily. And, and here's the thing, and, and I have to, I'm going to curl my comments because I don't want to give too much away for the sermon for Sunday. That's the, that's the danger of working on sermon and working on Bible study at the same time. I, I tend to bring that stuff in, and I don't want to all the time. But we don't know who is really righteous, do we? We don't. And Jesus makes that distinction when he's talking about the Sermon on the Mount and the fruit that they bear, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and let's just go on and get it out there. He says, everybody that says, Lord, Lord, will not enter into, into the kingdom of heaven. That's what the text is for Sunday. So now that you know, just let your mind start to wander. Uh, <laughs> but we have seen situations where people have been Godly, at least from our appearances, but yet they have suffered for whatever reason. And I'm not talking about financial suffering all the time. I'm talking about just suffering, just for whatever reason. And Coalette seems to say that even in all of that, even in all of that, he's seen the righteous forsaken. You know, I wonder all the time, why did God have to take Luther Vandross and leave some of these other folks? I'm, I'm just wondering, why in the world did Teddy P have to get crippled and leave here and some of these other folks who can't sing a note still around here, gang banging? They can't carry a tune in a bucket. Not to say that their life is any less. I'm just saying, just giving a choice of who could contribute more, you know. I'm, I'm just saying, no, 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 don't y'all come at me. Don't, don't come at me. I got my book tonight, and I'm going to explain what that means. Don't come at me. Don't come for me tonight. <laughs> Yeah, God, God wants good stuff too. And it might be their contribution was not in that arena like we think it should be, but their contribution is in something else that we didn't even see, we didn't even know of. Um, I was watching something. I'm always watching, catching stuff at the tail end. And I was watching this interview with Pat Morita, um, you know, the karate kid, uh, Mr. Miyagi. And he said that uh, he met Red Fox before he was Mr. Me before Pat Morita was famous. 
he met Red Fox. And he was telling Red Fox that he was trying to buy a house, and lo and behold, he get down the last three or four days, and he was $3,500 short. And he went to Red Fox, and he was talking to him, and he said, you know, I just need a loan, if you can just give me a loan. He says, and, and he did, if you can find it online, if I find it online again, I'll, I'll share it with y'all. But he did the perfect Red Fox imitation with his voice. But he basically said, Red Fox snapped his finger, and the lady went back, got his checkbook. He came back, and he wrote a check, and he says, I believe in you, and I believe that you're going places. So here's $3,500. Don't give it back to me. Pay it forward. And Pat Morita said, I've done that over and over and over again, 35,000 times. Uh, not $3,500 here, $5,000 here, and I've never asked for it back, but I've always given it because somebody poured into him, you know. And just think about that. When you do something or somebody does something for you and says, don't pay me, pay it forward, how many of us will actually do that? And that's doing the right thing because when you ask for it and somebody is giving it to you, while you don't owe them, you owe God. And God is telling you to do the right thing and pay it forward. So here he's saying, verse 16 and 17, avoid the extremes. You can be too stingy or you can be too free hearted. Don't be either or. Get right in the groove. Stay right in the groove. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Stay right there in the groove. If you're too tight with your, with your fist, nothing gets in, nothing's able to come out. If you're too loose, you don't have anything. Everybody comes and takes it away from you, you can't, and you wonder why in the world do I never have anything because you give it all away. And there's nothing wrong with giving stuff away. Don't get me wrong. Don't be a fool, as my mom used to say, because everybody, you hit, hit the lottery and find out how many cousins you got. I promise you. Verse 18, the fear of God brings balance and piety, which is a better way to go. What's piety? Humility. Doing the right things for the right reasons. Working for God's law. Doing what God's law says do. What's, what's the one law that God put out there that has not changed? Come on, disciples of God. I preach it every Sunday. Huh? Who? Love thy neighbor. That has not changed since God started this great big thing called the earth. That has not changed. That is all we're supposed to do is love. Sometimes love means saying no. I had to grip my pearls on that. Sometimes love lets them sleep outside just so they'll understand how good it is to be on the inside. I'm just saying, love hurts, but love also finds a way to heal the hurt. So what is he saying? Fear of God brings balance. If you do the God stuff, the Jesus stuff, the stuff that the Holy Spirit tells us to do, you'll never get too far left or too far right. You'll always be in that zone where God can still control and manipulate the situation. I shouldn't say manipulate because it gives us a very nebulous, nebulous meaning. But God can control the situation for the good. Remember, it's not necessarily our personal good, but it's the good of what God is bringing out of the situation. Okay? Never forget that. Questions, comments. So it's not for our good. You know, everything works out for my good. No, it don't. Everything ain't worked out necessarily for my good. I've had to learn some hard lessons out of some stuff. And you have too. You done bumped your head a few times. God done slapped you and said, told you. Told you don't do that. Just like that. It doesn't work out for our good. It could be that God removes something from you and gives it to somebody else because they need it and you don't even know that it's gone. I bet you if I went in your refrigerator right now and took something out, you wouldn't even re remember or know what it is because you got so much in there. Go in your closet. Now, me, I'm different, but you go in, I can go in your closet and pull out one of your dresses or one of your suits, and you wouldn't know which one it was because you got so many. Balance, people, balance. You can't fit it, let it go. Somebody else, I bet some of y'all got stuff, got, still got tags on it. 
Mm-hmm. Say amen if it hurt. Just say amen. Okay. Balance is the better way to go. Questions about that? Nobody mad? Everybody good? All right, let's keep going. (laughs) One wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Here's one that we all need to pay attention to. Never eavesdrop on others. You may hear your servant curse you, for you know how often you yourself have cursed others. That one we need to pay attention to. So what is he saying? First of all, wisdom gives strength. How many of y'all believe that? Absolutely. Because it's not all about here, it's about here. It's not always about what I got as it is my potential. See, let's be real. How many of y'all, and, and, and I'm, I hate using y'all, but it comes out, I'm sorry, that's the only southern part of me I got. <laughs> I'm not letting it go. Married people, when you married your mate, did you marry him because you loved him or was it because of the potential that they had? Wait, wait. <laughs> did you marry your mate? This is primarily for the guys. Did you marry your mate because you loved them or because of the potential that they had? Uh, both. Both. Loved them and saw the potential. Very diplomatic way out. <laughs> yeah. That's why I had to repeat it. Yeah. It's, it's okay. We're not going to release the tape to y'all spouses, I, I promise. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to flip it on you. I married out of potential. I married out of potential because I knew the things that I wanted to accomplish in life, but I also knew that this person that I was going to marry had things that they wanted to accomplish in life. And I knew if we could put those things together, we could have a very good life. Because I don't care what you say. When poverty walk in front door, love jump out the window. Amen? No romance without finance. I knew somebody said, yep. Yeah. Now, we can sit and be poor and eat bologna together. Beans and bologna. Some of y'all done seen that meme, you know, the brother on there, come on home, I got beans and bologna. If you ain't, I'll send you that one too. But let's be real. When you marry, you marry somebody that compliments you and is going where you're going and is working with you and you working with them to accomplish a bigger goal because it's about having kids. Kids cost money. They're expensive. Amen. Houses and cars and all this stuff that you kind of sort of need when you're you're building a family. So how does this relate? Wisdom tells you don't get with somebody who looks good and is an airhead. Don't get with somebody who has a PhD in gaming unless they're making the game. All right? Ladies, I'm talking to y'all who are a little younger. I'm just being real. Don't get with somebody who has nothing to bring to the table. No, I can't say that at the church. I almost said the Nicki Minaj song. (laughs) I'm just being real. I'm just being real. Have something other than a bright smile to bring to the table. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to leave that alone because I almost slipped. (laughs) Verse 21, bring that up for me. Verse 21, do not heed to everything people say. Oh, we have a problem with this. We hear one thing and we are cocked to the ticked off position. We walk around with it locked and loaded and and we're just pointing. Who who is it going to be today? Everything that's said, that now y'all do know that everybody's mouth cuts like this, right? Which means everybody has the potential to lie. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say lie. It's a harsh word. My mom told me not to say lie. Misplace the truth. How's that? Does that make you feel a little better? Now, if I meet somebody and their lips are cut this way, then I'm going to trust with everything they say because I've never seen anybody whose lips go like this. 
But everybody else that. Uh, here's one. Believe what? Half of what you what half of what you see and none of that you hear. Trust but verify. Trust but verify. That's how we get caught up. We trust what somebody says. That's how cults work. People trust what that person is saying. And they're coming out of a Bible and they're coming out of, with their version, <clears throat> which is a perverted, twisted version, and all of a sudden, they gone. They are simply gone on a lie. So believe half of what you see. None of that you hear. And we're talking about rumors. We're talking about any window. When somebody, <clears throat> break my book out. This is uh, historically black phrases. <clears throat> Give y'all this one because I saw it today and I felt like. This one is when someone says what had happened was, give you the definition, it says, I'm about to lie. It's used as a way to fill space while words and buying time for the speaker to organize the lie before telling it. It is also a sarcastic way to begin a statement that is potentially intended to be understood as untrue or factually flimsy. In other words, when Marcus arrived home two hours after he said he'd be there, Angela, having proof that he was cheating, asked him why he was late. Well, Marcus responded, see what had happened was, um, my boss um, had needed me to, uh, to stay, but I forgot to text you. Know what I'm saying? But she knew that he was lying. All I'm saying is when people start talking, just imagine that they're in front of the sentence, whatever it is, what had happened was, just, just remember that. And, start, and they'll start, you start laughing. And they'll be like, what are you laughing at? No, no, just keep talking. Just keep talking. Yeah. Who wrote that book? Uh, it is by Jared Hill and Travell Anderson. I give you the ISBN so you get you a copy. Yep. Yep. Refer back to them. Refer back to them. That's right. They cataloged it. <laughs> Absolutely. What had happened was. Just think that everybody, when they talk, what had happened was. And, and I was, as a police officer, I was trained in my mind, as I told y'all several weeks ago, I'm very cynical. When somebody tells me something, I take it with a grain of salt until I can verify it, until I know that it's true for myself. And that's how we need to be, y'all. Trust only what we can verify. I'm not going to take your word. That is why, and I'm leading into this, that is why when somebody calls and said, brother so-and-so told me to call you and tell you that they're in the hospital and they're not related to that person, they don't know that person on a regular basis, I'm not trusting it. I had a pastor, friend, mentor of mine, who said he stood up in the pulpit one Sunday on a phone call that somebody told him sister so-and-so had died and she had not. That's why I want to hear from the family when somebody dies, a close relative, a caretaker. So when folks call you and tell you, can you call, Pat? no, baby, you call, Pastor. Hit the phone number, because I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. I didn't say cow, I said horse. <laughs> All right? Because I don't believe until I can verify. All right? I'm not being offensive. I'm just saying. I'm not trusting what you say, because between your phone and my phone, it's going to get misinterpreted, I promise you. And everybody can call everybody, but they can't call me. Why is that? My phone is the most, phone, most listed phone number out there. I think George Bush got my phone numbers out there so much. <laughs> it's probably on the internet. <laughs> Servant. Go back to that for me, Darius. Servant is translated as subordinate. We all have some subordinates, whether they be children or whether they be people who work for us. Understand, he's actually pushing for grace in an era of law because he's living in an era where law, Jesus had not come, so grace was not a thing. But he is actually a forerunner saying, have a little grace on these folks. Have a little easiness on them. This section is a call for grace in a time of law in full view of human imperfection. See, when you recognize how imperfect you are as a person, then you can have grace on other folks. 
You know, the one who has never broken a law has never done anything. That's not the policeman I want on the street who pulls me over. I want the one that was speed when they was a teenager. So when they pull me over, they look at me and be like, you know what, I, I understand. I'm going to let you off with a warning this time. Not the one that is by the book. Well, if I pulled you over, I have to give you something. Where did that law come in at? Never heard that law before. <laughs> Shame on you. Any other questions about this section? One wise person is stronger than 10 leading citizens of a town. Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Who is that one person? Who? Y'all can say we're in church. It's okay. Who was it? Jesus. The one who did. Perfect. Walk this earth. Perfect. Never sin. Perfect. The one. Everybody else? We all have come short of the glory. But thank God in coming short of the glory, we have a way to ask for forgiveness. Amen? Look at the next one. I have always tried my best to let wisdom guide my thoughts and actions. I said to myself, I am determined to be wise, but it didn't work. Wisdom is always distant and difficult to find. I searched everywhere, determined to find wisdom and to understand the reason for things. I was determined to prove to myself that wickedness is stupid and that foolishness is madness. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Her passion is a snare and her soft hands are chains. Watch out, that. Those who are pleasing to God will escape her, but sinners will be caught in her snare. <sighs> Ladies, y'all feel up. Just, 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 just fine, just fine. I'm, I'm, finna, I'm finna help y'all out. This is not about a woman. Let me start there. This is not about a woman. This is about the, whenever God wants to use an example of something, God will use, for instance, God used adultery as the way to explain going after other gods. So in this case, because God made the woman like God made the woman, <laughs> God knows that a woman can get a man to do anything. All right, <clears throat> let, me, let me back it all the way up. In the garden of Adam and Eve, the only way to get to Adam was through Eve. Satan knew if I can get the woman to buy in, the man is going to follow suit. And that is still true today. If you get the woman, if you get the wife, you got the man. Because if a man truly loves his wife, his woman, his whomever, that's going to be the one, that's going to be his soft spot. It's like a baby's head's got a soft spot. That's the man's soft spot, however you look at it. So God knows, like he says here, coalesce. I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. He's not so much talking about a seductive woman as he is the snares that come with misplaced wisdom. Wisdom in the Greek vernacular is called a feminine gendered word. Now, I'm, let me break this down to Greek words have gender, but not like we think we, they have gender. They're not male, female, but it's called feminine and masculine and neuter. Feminine words produce something. So wisdom produces something. Okay? The, 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 feminine, the word that is used for mother is a feminine word, whereas woman is neuter. Because mother produces something, but a woman is seen as being just neuter, just simple, just by herself. All right? Y'all good? Didn't get too deep there, did I? Okay. So now what he is doing, he's using wisdom as a litmus test for all things. Wisdom is the standard by which he will look at everything in the world. The reality is, pop that up for me, Darius. The reality is, is wisdom is, un, is inaccessible. You can't get it. You can't just go out and find some wisdom. I was talking to a group today, and I said, y'all understand you can gain knowledge, and through knowledge comes wisdom. But you can't just go get wisdom without knowledge because wisdom has to have something to work on. If you have no knowledge, you can't be wise because you don't know nothing. 
And somebody can say, well, I've never been to school, but I got wisdom. You probably do. I wouldn't doubt it because you've done some things, but you have learned from those things, and that's what wisdom comes from. See, <clears throat> let's go back to my very simple analogy. Knowledge will get you the job. Wisdom will keep you on the job. Knowledge will get you the house. Wisdom will keep you in the house. Okay? Wisdom does something. Knowledge gets you to it. Wisdom gets you and keeps you. So God made humanity upright, but God also takes responsibility for everything that is placed in the human heart. See, if we don't allow it to come into the heart and God doesn't allow it, it ain't coming. Do you ever notice that some things you just can't retain for nothing? Because God don't need it in you. God knows that there's a problem if it gets in you. And it's, going to be, and it's going to corrupt you possibly. Or it's just useless information. God don't want you to have it. So everything that goes into your heart, God controls. See, we have to understand God is still the doorkeeper of our heart. I don't care what Gladys Knight said. You know, you're the landlord and the keeper of our love. Oh, never mind, never mind. Okay. Y'all got to catch up on y'all's R&B if y'all going to learn it. <laughs> One in 1,000 men and no women shows the misogyny of the writer or preference of men over women. All I'm simply saying in that note is that just because he uses a woman to say that she's more seductive and all of this kind of stuff, it doesn't mean that it's just a woman. It's some men out there that are just as sneaky, just as smooth. They will, they will charm you right on into the, into the house. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Somebody need to say amen. <laughs> we go another one, tell the truth, shame the devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's look at this a little closer. A seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Why do you think he would say that? More bitter than death. Come on. Hmm? It's peaceful. At least with death, you got God. But with this woman who is luring a trap and bitter in the trap, let me see how I can phrase this. You got to live with that. And when you got to live with something, it's more painful, or it seems more painful than death, you know. Worst thing that you could do in high school was to see your ex-girlfriend, ex-boyfriend with a new boyfriend, new girlfriend. That was a pain bitter than death, more bitter than death. Amen? Oh, come on. Y'all act like y'all just been holy, sanctified, and just, I'm just good, Rev. I ain't never, when I left him, he was done. <laughs> After you went through that box of chocolate, that carton of, that carton of ice cream, and all them love songs, yeah, he was, he was history then. I know him, right? I had a sister. <laughs> I got a sister. <laughs> so her passion is a snare. Let's look at that. Passion is a snare. What is passion? We're adults, but what is passion? Come on. Is it the feeling or is it the action? Passion. Huh? Craving? A desire? I like that desire. Yeah. So what does that mean? That her passion is a snare. Is it looking that good that you want it and you give up anything to get it? And why does he put it in the context of trying to search for wisdom? Go ahead. I like that. She says, the thought process before the action is the snare. Correct? Did I sum it up right? Yeah. Thought process. That R&B. I got to go back to them. Is it the bar case? Bar case? No, it wasn't the bar case. The song was Anticipation. Anybody remember Anticipation? I can't think of Anticipation. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Who was that? Yeah. Huh? No, that wasn't Carly Simon. That wasn't Carly. I'm talking about the black version of anticipation. <laughs> anyway, huh? 
It's, it, I'm, I want to say it was the Bar Ks, but I don't think, I don't know if it was. I thought it was. Okay, it's the Bar Ks. So, anticipation is more daunting, more pointed. What's the word I want to use? I'm, I'm lost here. A lot of times anticipation is greater than the act itself. Think about when you wanted to go on vacation as a child. And y'all finally going to make that great big trip from Minneapolis to St. Paul. <laughs> you couldn't sleep at all the night before because when you getting up in the morning, y'all leaving. So every hour you rolling over looking at the clock. Oh, man, it's just 2 o'clock. Oh, man, it's just 2.30. Anticipation keeps you up all night. And then when it finally happens, it's like, oh, that was it. That, that's what I stayed up all night for? So that's what he's talking about here. The anticipation, possibly, of gaining wisdom, is, it keeps you up at night. It keeps you rolling, keeps you running. Another Doobie Brothers song. <laughs> keep, songs keep popping in my head tonight. And her soft hands are chains. It traps you. Think about chains. Now, Handcuffs, that's a wonderful invention because it made some comfort to the prisoner. But think about when they put chains around their wrist and the kind of damage that it did and the pain that it caused. So therefore, you've got this pleasure and you've got this pain working together for wisdom. Didn't see that, did you? Pleasure, the anticipation, the excitement, and then you've got this other side with these chains. So wisdom is a combination of both the good and the bad. If you don't have rain and sun, you can't get wisdom out of the knowledge that you've got. Watch out, Holy Spirit. Takes it both. Those who are pleasing to God will escape her, but sinners will be caught in her snare. God is still protecting, even though we're letting ourselves fall into it. God is still right there saying, oh, nope, not going to let you fall for that one. Phone rings at a certain time. It rains. Anything. You think it's happenstance. That's God saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to save you from that because I don't want you to have that. You don't need that. That ain't what you want. Ready? All good? Let's go to the last one. This is my conclusion. And that's perfect because we're going to stop at chapter 8. This is my conclusion, says the teacher. I discovered this after looking at the matter from every possible anger, angle. Okay, so now he is coming to a conclusion. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. He was a misogynist. Let's just let's put it out there. It's a man's world. But I did find this. God created people to be virtuous, but they have turned, they have each turned to follow their own downward path. What he is basically saying is God made humanity upright, but God also must take responsibility for everything else placed in the human heart. God can't just let it be. God put it all there, the good and the bad. Because think about it, and, and, and let's just be real. Let's, we're going to be adults here, except for the baby, and he can't understand yet. Let's be adults for a second. The passion and the desire for intercourse. God put that in you. That's not something dirty from the devil. God put that in you because in the Garden of Eden, when God brought Adam and Eve together and said, be fruitful and multiply, God had to put that desire in both of them. Otherwise, they wouldn't want to do it. And if it's not pleasurable, you definitely won't do it. Our problem is, is that we take our pleasure to the extreme. That's our problem. But that's not a God and putting it in our heart problem. God put that in your heart to desire a man, to desire a woman. Don't discount that. You're supposed to. You wouldn't be human, made in the image of God, if you didn't have a desire to be with that man or with that woman. That's a desire that God put there. Do not discount it for any circum under any circumstances and for any reason. We're supposed to have that because God put it there. Anything God does is good. Am I correct? Including that. That's why intercourse is such a powerful thing. 
You can paint off the wall if you ain't careful. If you took the energy, the kinetic energy that is, that is encapsulated in intercourse, it'll take the paint off the wall. It'll bring down foundations because there is power in it. God placed power in it. Didn't think about it that way, did you? Y'all just thought, well, it's just for having kids, for procreation. No, there is power there. That's why we got to be careful with that power. Y'all better say amen. Because we, we got babies over there that don't know the kinetic power that is available to them yet. <laughs> that God Jr. up here coming through the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Did I say we all grown? That what you said? For sure. For sure. Finally, any questions? But that's what he's saying. God put all this in your heart. The good, the bad, the ugly. Now, we have manifested other things that have brought into our hearts as well. And that stuff is environmental. Because children are not born racist. They are groomed to be that. It is environmental. Children just want to play and have fun. That's all they want to do. And yet we bring them home and tell them, well, you know, they don't look like us, so you can't really play with them, but you can play with them. What make them better than them? See, that's the kind of stuff that we start putting in our children's hearts that God just shake his head and say, you know what? I ain't even do that. I sometimes think that God looks down and just goes, gave y'all too much sense. We got to be careful. That's why this environment is so important, this place that we call church, this thing that we call ministry. It's so important because we can kind of undo some of the poison that's been poured into people. We can kind of put them on an IV and get them on the, new, on, the, on the good stuff instead of the bad stuff that the world's been giving them all this time. Okay? Questions, comments? All right, so when I close out tonight, I figure I better give y'all one. I didn't mean to give it the other one, but I'm going to give you one. This is from the church section of the book. That's the ones that I'm going to give you. So there's the definition of casket sharp. Y'all ready for this one? Impeccably dressed or well put together. A phrase to express being impressed with someone's wardrobe, grooming, and or styling. Derived from the idea that someone's burial attire is some of the best clothing they will ever likely wear. But on that occasion... <laughs> Uh, an example, dressed in a brand new suit and looking good for his graduation, Juwan walked into the room and his grandfather said to him, boy, you looking casket clean and sharp. I like that suit. So now you can correctly use the phrase casket sharp. See, it's an educational thing. All right. Uh, let's see. Next week, we'll start with chapter eight. Again, he makes another turn. And then we'll continue in chapter 8. We're going to, just so you know, so you can plan, the week of Thanksgiving. That Wednesday, we will not be in session for Bible study or Sunday school. We take that entire week off for sabbatical. And then the last two weeks of the year, uh, we'll take off or the last week of the year between. I'll let you know that date. But it's the week right before Christmas we take off as well from Bible studies and Sunday schools so that we can all have a break. You know, don't y'all need a break? Amen. Amen. Okay, give me two more weeks, and then we can take a break. All right. <laughs> Let us stand. And God, as we go away from this place tonight, not away from your presence, but away from this place that we call a church where we gather together and we learn from one another. Most of all, we've got, we're listening and learning from you. Pray that as we move down the street and we turn corners and go down back roads that you'll Stay with us. She'll go ahead of us. That she'll watch over our families and our friends until we can return again. And God, I ask this thing, that you will protect this church family, that you will keep all of the evil that is trying to come in out, and that you will protect each one of us in your own way so that we will not fall victim to any of the issues and the problems of the world. But you'll protect us, God. And let us be courageous in proclaiming that you are our God and that we are your people. And that we can bring someone else into the fold so they can understand what is this thing that we call church. 
And what is it about that God that we love so much? It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray. Go in peace and we say amen.